now for the people watching that don't were just two ciphers on the planet of billions of people. The noise that you heard was the poets speaking to one another and the dogs barking. Okay, we're, we're at the National Beat Poetry Festival weekend. It's raining outside. We're inside and we are talking to Adam and his dad, David Amram. Those pets remind me of visiting Attica prison. Yeah, we picked up all the chairs. Incarceration is a drag. Hey, hey Adam, being um, the son of David Amram, a man who's admired around the world no. for his heart and his soul, but do you ever get a chance to like just hey dad and ask him something philosophical? Because oh yeah, we spend a lot of time together. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I've been playing in his band too since I was a baby, so we have that relationship of the same relationship you'd have with if you're in a band with someone, musical relationships. That becomes a brotherhood within itself. Anytime you play music with someone and you travel with someone and you share the stage with someone, that becomes a brotherhood within itself. Even if it's a complete stranger, someone who's not related to you. So having that relationship with other people is a blessing. And then being able to have that with him also is a blessing too. So there's two two types of relationship we have. We have the normal father and son relationship, but then lucky enough we're able to have the uh, music relationship. In the music relationship, you're able to con have conversations and with people through music, and that's its own language, which is un unspoken, and it's extremely intuitive and, and, uh, and fun. So, you have your father not talking. Don't stop now. Oh, no. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm listening. I know. But see, yeah, I learn right. a lot from yeah. hanging out with Adam, and, and he's got he's his not. own he's thing. He's got his own band. He does his own music. Yeah. He said one time, he said, Daddy, I don't know if you want to hear what we're doing. I said, man, whatever it is, I want to come and check it out. I'm your father, and I love you, I don't care whatever you do. Where, what, where was this first time? Where was it, and what was the band? That's when you played with Ken. Yeah, but I mean, I think the very first time, we have a VHS of a 4-H fair. Oh, yeah. And it was a, the very first band, he was the side man. He was a side man? He was a side man. I got very lucky to have David Amos as a father and as a side man. Yeah. I think I was six or seven. We had, we played a, a county 4-H fair with me and this other six-year-old six saxophone player. Wow. Yeah. So you were playing sax at six years old? I was playing drums and I had a really close friend that was also six that was playing sax. Okay. It could have been eight. Six is a little too young, I think. And, and the nice thing is, we both got better <laughs> since then. Um, and that's the whole thing. So, all right, what about, the, what about the first time when you said, Dad, you're not going to like it? Where was that? And you went and saw him. Oh. What band was that? Uh, that we, we, we I guess when I was with Rock. Ken, yeah. And that was unbelievable. What was the name of the band? That was about 10 years ago. That was maybe more than 10 years ago. More than that, yeah. That was, uh, I was playing in a two-piece band. And uh, it was just... Very loud. But I can go very now. Go loud. 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 Yeah, it's very loud. What loud. was the name of it? What was the gist of, uh, if you had to describe it really quickly? To, uh, just a nice loud, loud rock and roll. Loud rock and roll. Yeah. Two pieces. Yeah. What, what were the instruments? It's guitar and drums and two, and then we both sang. And you both sang. Yeah. I love the. And then my bandmate was Japanese and didn't speak any English. Yeah. I don't get. Sang in Japanese and I sang in English. Wow. That is a cool little addition. Yeah, it was a fun little project. So we were able to, like I was saying before, when you play music with people, sometimes it's it's an unspoken language and you can communicate without without actually speaking. So. My what old was band. the name of that project? Did you ever record? Oh, yeah, yeah. We toured all over Japan and China and we went to Taiwan and all over America. I did that for about five years. And from 2010 to 2015. And then, uh, since then, though, I've been in a side man and been in many, many, many different projects. And that that was projects. your baby, the two of you. That was one of the that was one of the many 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's just constantly always making stuff. I just came out with an album last year during Corona time. Oh. Yeah. Recorded at home, stayed home, did yep. the whole thing? Yep, did the whole thing. And all, the, all the instruments? Or Everything, yeah, yeah. Oh, all wow. The instruments and Real, uh, what was the name of that? Ark of the Diver, who did that? Steve Winwood. Oh, yeah. He was one of the first people to do an album. Al he played every single yeah. instrument. Yeah. Steve Winwood was one of the four from oh, no. uh, Blind Fate. Oh, right. Right, so there was Ginger Baker. Yeah. Uh, Eric, Eric, uh, Eric Clapton. Yeah. Uh, My grandson is seven. Yeah. Him and there was one other. It was a fourth in, in Blind Faith. One of my favorite all time albums. Yeah, I should, I should listen. That's amazing. I didn't know he did that. So, what did you think when you saw this two piece Japanese thing? What was your like? I was amazed. Yeah. And there was one part, it was like the exorcist when you see her spinning her head around on about there. And Adam was playing the drums and playing, playing up a storm, and suddenly jumped up, and it looked like his head was spinning around. <laughs> but I was watching everything he was doing. I listened to it. Damn, man, that's some, that's some other stuff. I never saw anybody do that. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it. And I saw the whole picture. And it wasn't sitting there listening to a record with a bunch of people in polyester suits saying, Oh, we're going to merchandise this. Yeah. This was just the experience <laughs> of witnessing an amazing musical group. And half of the amazing musical group was my son, Adam. I said, damn, boy, that's a whole other language. Right. Something I'd never seen before, and I really dug it. So, uh, on the it was introducing me to a world I knew nothing wow. about. And After enjoyed. a lifetime of music. The well, furniture. I'm just another person that's been lucky yeah. enough, and I added that to my vocabulary of experience. So I'm going to ask you first, and then Adam. Uh, the difference between I'm going to give you two things. You can go anywhere you want with it. Art and entertainment. The difference between the two, and noise and silence. Really mm. bad. Anything you want to go with on that, you and then you. Just Adam, kind of, oh, my thing we art by nature is entertainment. When the entertainment industry, like the dinosaur, was at its last gasping before it disappeared, or the Titanic was, where it was about to sink to the bottom, we were witnessing the demise of the old entertainment industry itself because basically it was no longer entertaining and yeah, we there was not shows, a real you know, industry because there weren't enough hard working, Oops, Lori, dedicated, devoted people here. who were industrious <laughs> enough to make it <laughs> worth anything. However, people's desire <clears throat> to be entertained and to feel good has nothing to do with what the entertainment industry told us we had to enjoy or else we sucked no, even okay. more than we thought we did before we put on that so-called entertainment to assuage our bad feelings of being such creeps. And I don't believe we are such creeps. And I think that the entertainment industry, like so many things in our culture, were based on the idea that we all sucked and therefore would be less revolting if we bought certain things that we don't need for way more than they cost, way beyond the old old idea of building a better mousetrap. Do you, do you think today artists are free to create or are they obliged to appease? Well, we've always been free to create and some people have created symphonies written in concentration camps when they knew they were dying, that it's just as beautiful as they snuck out the paper that somehow they wrote and there are people who have worked all their life died penniless and some who died wealthy but kept like Cezanne who came from a wealthy family who worked his ass off as a artist people have always been free to create if they want to do it because then they realize they're going to somehow do it and as far as the what was the other appeasement one? creating because you feel like if you don't do it no one's going to like you and that's the industry standard yeah, well you have to get over that because if you're worried about that there's always going to be someone that tells you you're a creep and if you do something outside of the creephood restrictions, you're bound to antagonize those who make the choices, usually whose skill 
is in getting the gig of being the choice maker, which is a hell of an achievement. Being an administrator, being the boss, being in charge, but have no idea of what they're in charge of or who they're supposed to be appealing, not appealing to, but the point I'm making is there's some people who are very gifted at at merchandising, but if they don't have any sense of what they are merchandising, or they don't give a hoot, I'm using polite language, of their responsibility to somehow uplift and help out by what they're selling, they deserve to make a living, then they're not really doing their job. There's a responsibility involved, and there's a responsibility as an artist, you know, not not to uh, defecate on the floor as a statement that you don't know, like American farm policy or to do something ugly and revolting necessarily for its own sake. When, when Picasso did the Guernica, it was shocking and people thought it was horrible, but he was addressing a certain situation that was going on in Spain that was really horrible and making people aware of it. He had a higher purpose yeah, they had, they had than shocking. And so the really commercial viewpoint is to make people say, yeah, that makes me feel good, and then throw it in the wastebasket to be replaced by something else. So it doesn't always have to be um, June and Moon lyrics in order to make a good song. But there are certain responsibilities that we all have. And then on the other hand, noise and silence. What's, what does that mean? Well, it's like yin and yang. There, there's an opposite. Noise is something that we, that we identify as sounds that we find una either unappealing or unnecessary or brutalizing. So what was considered to be noise by someone, when Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker were playing and they said, ah, the guys don't play a tune, they're playing too fast. Then when it became fashionable, people that they couldn't play Mersey Dodes on a major scale went, blah, 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 and put on fake coatees and, and, and horn rim glasses with no lenses and, and, and wear berets and pretended they were playing bebop but they couldn't play swing or the 12 bar blues or a scale. What year is this though? Oh, this this was in the 40s. Suddenly, this what, was 40s. Cons yeah, what considered to be noise became fashionable, God help us. That was even worse. But the people who created that music, like so many, people like Thelonious Monk, continued what they were doing and advancing what they were doing. And finally, they were appreciated. So people said to me, man, all those great guys from Beethoven string quartets up to Thelonious Monk, they were ahead of their time. I said, no, they were right on time. And sometimes took people, industrial world or whoever, to catch up. But there were always people that were there at that right on time who appreciated it. And it was built to last and it will as John Keats said, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. It'll always be there. And Charlie Parker, when I met him in 52, I was like 21 year old Hasey in my basement apartment. And I said, Bird, what's it like you wrote this song? Now's the time in 1945. Here it is, 1951 or 52. I said, that was because of seven years. For a 20, guy 21 years old, that was a third of my life, so I thought it would be ancient history. He said, That's, he said what, what is it with now's the time? He said, now's the time because now was the right time, now is the right time, and now will always be the right time because he said, now is the right time. So, all right, so let's move over to Adam. Uh, and so the same same thing. Uh, <clears throat> anywhere you want to go with it, uh, he started with uh, art and entertainment, and then noise and silence. Um, I don't think I can explain it any better than that. I mean, I was kind of getting schooled and listening myself uh, to everything he was just saying, and kind of taking taking that on. And especially as a younger musician, listening to and listening. Uh, as far as just the word silence in general is a great word. 
especially at my age right now. Uh, and the type of music that I'm playing now and the way I'm trying to evolve musically, silence is a great space and silence and dynamics is uh, goes is goes very well in music and also goes very well in life. I think I can't explain, <laughs> say anything more. more what about the generational there. thing? He referred to artists from another time and another era. Is there a parallel that you see when he talks about Bird or Picasso oh, yeah. uh, to today and how they handled? Do people even recognize, like you said, people in, in Picasso didn't even recognize what he was doing, like, or today we can't see back and see what it is that he was doing in his context of time. Is there, is there a way Absolutely. you can bring that into, like... Well, I think it's on, I think that's an ongoing thing in humanity forever, and the bigger picture is that's never ending, there's never, like David said, there was people in, there was composers in concentration camps that were trying to write symphonies on their marching to the deathbed, you know, so I think that's just a human drive in certain people. And, you know, and maybe when everything is stripped away, the music industry and all that distraction, uh, the art actually will be more honest and true. You know. What do you mean more honest? Uh, when there's less, when there's less, you know, if you're, if, for people I've known who've made it into the music world, every time they get a different contract, a different contract, their music is, has to change in order to fulfill whatever contract they're in for whatever company. You know. So I think I think art should have no no bound at all. And, you know, but if you're represented by a company, then there's certain things you can say or can't say. Right? So when I when I mentioned Pink Floyd have a cigar, and he was talking about the contracts and being beholden, uh, you know the lyrics of that song, right? Yeah, I don't know. Come on, have a cigar, you're gonna go uh, far. Uh, I've been, I've been on You guys are really gonna make it to the top. By the way, which one's Pink? That song. I've been on an insane <laughs> Louis Armstrong kick. You've never heard that. It's a great lyric. you got to check it out. It's a nice piece of art. It's a, it's a piece of art on a commercial album yeah. criticizing the commercial process. Yeah. You remember that. So that yeah, that's yeah. kind of an art and entertainment. Do you think that can happen today? You could sign a contract and still say what you want? Or are you beholden? And do contracts even exist anymore? What's yeah, happening? I think it's just such a different world. I don't think anybody knows what... What's contem What's happening now in, contempor in the contemporary industry world? Nobody knows what's. <clears throat> even the people in charge right now are, don't know how long they're going to be in charge for. It's so, just, in in sports, they're now making and in, and in journalism, they're now making journalists and uh, athletes to sign over the rights to their image and everything that they do in perpetuity. Is that the word forever? Yeah. 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 In perpetuity, yeah. Uh, yeah. in any and all forms that exist now or ever will exist. Yeah. And so, uh, as, a, as an artist into, uh, into what physics, AI, holography, holographic technology of you will exist in the future. You're going to be able to perform as a hologram when you're gone. So whoever has that right can control what you say from a future voice. Because AI is real. Well, I think the thing is that makes you responsible by you, I mean everybody, to be their own anthropologist. You're responsible. And what you're holding in your hands as we're talking right now at this wonderful festival, this, when stuff gets on YouTube and stays there, anybody doing anything is going to be responsible for what they say and what they do. So today, a whole new generation with all the tsunami of swill that's been dumped upon them with the tacit understanding that whatever it is, in three weeks will be ready for the dumpster to be replaced with more trash designed by those who never learned to sing and dance to go to the dumpster because it's all a waste of time anyway. That's fine if that's part of the aesthetic of a certain, certain period in our culture, but that's diminishing. And the YouTube provides the possibility of finding some needles in the haystack, some diamonds in the sidewalk, things of beauty which are meaningful, 
Yeah, and as a 90-year-old, I go yeah. on this is YouTube, I, yeah. and I can see people younger than Adam. Killer musicians, songwriters, singers, dancers, poets, chefs, athletes, philosophers, and big mouths, like I'm accused of being myself sometimes, you know, who has something interesting to say, and you can find that like stuff. Like diamonds in the sidewalk. Right. <laughs> that's going to be the name of a band someday. No, that's, I, put that, I put that in my book. And oh, really? I'll be collaborating with Kerouac, and that's cool. But anyway, oh, it's a beautiful line. But, but the idea, because I said to Jack, here we are. I found Walking on the mind. dark side of the street, why don't you be like Fats Waller or let's walk on the sunny I side of the Ducal Street, or we'll fall into a place where they left the trap door open by mistake. He said, no man, a writer's supposed to be in the shadows. But then he said, check out those diamonds in the sidewalk. I said, what? And then he said, look down. And I looked down between all the Suvlaki wrappers and crap and junk that was lying all over the streets in the 1950s. Now, we're changing that. But you could see that little glistening. He said, man, those are the diamonds in the sidewalk. That's the beauty that surrounds us that we don't pay any attention to. Check that out. The younger generation has the option for free on their own choice and their own good luck and stumbling and fumbling to find some extraordinary stuff. And as I was saying, as a 90-year-old, I find guys and gals that I played with and can really study them 15 times in a row what they're doing, sitting at home quietly with no phone ringing with no nothing. And I can see young people i never heard of and old people i never heard of from countries all around the world. There's a lot of great information which you have an option to see hear look at study and think about and then you can turn the computer off and do your own stuff and realize that you can use the palette like the painters use of your knowledge and experience and create your own stuff with some broader picture than is Mr. Cigar Smoker in a polyester suit going to allow this to be franchised and will they let it be franchised for more than a week before they throw it in the dumpster. So you're not designed to have a one in a million shot of maybe getting to the point where you could be dumpster material. Therefore, that dumpster material is still a few croaking dinosaurs left in the so-called music industry. Music is not dead by any means. So I always tell jazz musicians, folk musicians, symphony composers, and I'm all three, that I have been my whole life, so it's not a multiple personality disorder. I've been interested in pursuing beauty. Never mind that diagnosis. I'm going to step on that. Oh, and hanging out. Well, I'm taking that one. I'm only taking the diagnosis of what I was told. That's the worst disease which always was for 30, 50 years, get out of the place. I said, no, I'm interested in many things of beauty that touch my heart, and I try to know more about them, and I'll still be that way. And if I, I'm 100, if I change, I'll be mad at myself. I don't think every any everybody should be that way, incidentally. Everybody oh should be what they feel they were put here That's to do, and then bust their chops fun. doing that. Regardless of what you have to do to pay the rent. Because we're all born creative until we're talked out of it. Thank you. So I just wrapped this up because I'm pretty sure the, the environment here is going to be calling on you soon. On the note, oh, there's so much fear being fed to us, 24-7, 365. Yeah. I believe that, as an artist myself, that people are starting to become blind to surrendering their freedoms and their liberty, liberties in exchange for feeling safe inside the fear that's being imposed upon them. So if we continue to diminish our responsibility to remain free-thinking so, beings uh, uh, against, and instead choose to serve the fear that's being fed us, and divide us as a species, yeah. those who are afraid and are willing to obey the fear, and those who are uh, willing to stand up and question, is this fear worth obeying in the, at the price of our liberties and freedoms? So uh, if, if that diminishes, and then you and I will both be gone someday, so what, what, what would you, that's what I'm trying to do is preserve the, the essence of that we have a mind, that we're free to speak without being killed for what we say, that we shouldn't be afraid to make art or love or have a voice. So if that diminishes, uh, maybe a pearl on that note to wrap up this little video.
Well, people have been saying for thousands of years that that's diminishing. There's always been a struggle, and there are always people that stood up, and then later, even if they die in prison or get assassinated, what they stood for remains universal because that wonderful song of Dylan's about dogs run free, that applies to people and thought. And, and you can't merchandise that, and you can't destroy that. And people who complain that everything's too expensive, ever since Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, the rents have been too high, and men and women have been struggling with each other. So, you know, being a history major and working with the classics as well as what's happening now, then, and, and will happen, um, there's, there's always been antipathy, there's always been struggle, but there's also always been a lot of beauty.